So moving on uh, to a slightly different topic, how was the actual like model training process overall? Did you have to go through a lot of iterations on how your model is structured or, or anything like that? Yeah, so there was a lot of, uh, there, was, there was a lot of works with, you know, building the correct uh, model, uh, building the correct architecture, uh, finding the correct loss functions. Uh, but with everything that I do, with all the research that I do, uh, regardless of the component uh, that I'm trying to, uh, you know, optimize, you know, finding the best architecture, finding the correct loss functions, you know, I always start with a, a, a POC, a small, uh, I take a small set of images, and I make sure that my model is able to perform and do what I want on the small set of images. Because then I know that there's, you know, potential for this model to work well. Then I start adding more data. I start uh, say changing the model architecture, uh, relaxing the assumptions that I've made on my data and, and things like that. And every time I do this, I, I change, I always change one component at a time in order to better understand, you know, how does each component affect the overall system? You know, how changing the loss functions or, or is each of the loss functions really important, right? How much do they affect the final result? And that way I'm able to really understand you know, what do I have to focus on and what's a bit less important? And, and this really allowed us to, you know, uh, kind of from the bottom up, you know, take each of these small components and combine them together in a way that really gave us the, the final results. I think throughout this, uh, you know, this building process, uh, one of the things that really helped us uh, into getting this, the final result was uh, visualizations. Um, Visualizing the training process and you know, the losses, visualizing intermediate results throughout the training process, because this really helped us understand um, where our model was going. You know, very early on in the uh, when we designed the system, right? So we were able to do some very quick iterations in order to get the final result. Uh, did you utilize any like particular techniques, or did you just do this all simultaneously? sequentially as you are exploring the process and getting a feel of the domain? Yeah, so it was mainly trial and error. It was mainly like sequential, let's focus on the architecture. Okay, it seems like we got a good architecture. Let's focus on the losses. For example, one of the, with the PSP, my first work, uh, one of the things that really made a huge difference was that when we're talking about uh, the human domain, for example, uh, we're very, like I said we were earlier, we're very sensitive to changes. Uh, in uh, you know eye color, in uh, head shape, and things like that. So we actually added a identity loss, right? A loss that really focused the model on preserving the input, the individual identity, right? So we built on existing losses and said, let's introduce a, a new loss that, from what I understood, was the first time that this loss was used in in GAMS, and we saw this was a huge improvement over previous works. So just understanding limitations of the existing approaches and the existing the, the tools that uh, people use and seeing how we can overcome these with new techniques really made a huge difference uh, in our final results. Nice. Did you ever have to like go back and like retool how you were going about it? How many like dead ends did you run into while doing the uh, research? Endless, endless <laughs> amount of, uh, you know, you take uh, you know one step fo one step forward, two steps back. It, it's a lot of pro it's a lot of uh, you know iterations, uh, and it can be kind of uh, tiring. But uh, at the end of the day, if you make a you know a, a good enough plan and you have a good enough setup for you know running experiments and comparing the results, it really helps uh, make progress in uh, in the research. I, and I get one question about the the way you transform the initial image to the second one when you add a you, you stylized it in the second, in the output. So did you, did it take any sort of like artistry to like, you know, make some sort of, I don't know, mask or overlay or something to, how did you design the tunification process? Yeah, so actually there was, there was no uh, special uh, things that we had to do for the tunification uh, to work uh, well, uh, we actually, if we talked about earlier, like StyleGAN generates uh, images of say human faces of uh, cars, animals, like we saw in the video. We actually changed the StyleGAN to a StyleGAN that knows how to generate uh, tunes, generate like uh, animated images. And then we just use the same encoder uh, that we have for faces, paired it with the StyleGAN for tunes. And then we were able to translate between the real images and the tunes, right? So mm -hmm. 
very surprising uh, that it worked. Uh, and it, it worked quite, uh, quite well without too many tricks, right? So, the, so that, that was actually kind of surprising that it actually worked uh, quite uh, easily. Uh, you mentioned in your paper that you had to do some bootstrapping, though, for uh, getting better quality outputs from the style again. Can you explain a little bit about what that process is and how it affected the whole thing? Yeah. So when we talk about uh, tunification, right, we have, we're going to think about it as two different tasks. Uh, we can think about it as we want to take an image and find its latent representation. That's one task. And the other task is take this latent representation and find it and change to the tunify style, right? And both, both of these tasks by themselves are quite challenging. So with, and we, we typically ask a network to do this transformation, these two steps uh, together. And asking the network to do this, these two things together is quite challenging. So with the bootstrap, what we did, we said, let's split this task into two parts. Let's first make sure we get a good latent embedding of the real image. And then we'll use another network to take this latent embedding and change it to its tunify uh, version. All right, so the bootstrap was say, let's take a challenging problem, break it into two, and then it, it simply works much better because we, we make sure that each network can focus on one thing rather than focusing on two different uh, things at once. So you would, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you would sort of describe the bootstrap process as like a translation between the late, one set of uh, embeddings to the embeddings required for a different style again, right? Exactly. So this is maybe a weird question, but this would this work with any style again? Could you make a face out of somebody's, uh, could you make a car out of somebody's face if you uh, <laughs> did the embedding properly? So if you could do that, that would be uh, pretty cool. But uh, I think uh, why the Tunify worked very well is because the two domains of uh, human faces, like real faces, and Tunify faces are very, very similar to each other. So it allowed us to do this transformation quite easily. But if I take two very different domains, I don't think it would work, right? So we actually leverage this uh, like domain knowledge of doing this transformation between two similar domains in order to perform this translation. Ah, that, that, that's actually pretty interesting because I did notice that in the TUNIT papers intro, um, they, I, when they were playing the clips of the Tunify one, it worked really well. But when they were, we were trying to Tunify the animals, it didn't work as well. So I guess like, for example, if you were doing horses and then you went off of like Bojack Horseman, you know, the cartoon, you could like, if you had a whole bunch of cartoon horses, it'd be easier to make accurate animal translations. Yeah. So yeah, you really have to understand uh, what, like the two domains that you're working with, you know, how, first of all, we, you need to know, you know, that your style again uh, is good and represents, is able to generate very, very good images of the domain. And the two domains have to be similar, right? Uh, but there's a, there's a long way, uh, we, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, with style again in order to, you know, for example, uh, natural images uh, and really making a, you know, all purpose generator that's able to generate uh, multiple domains using a single model. Right, so there's still a lot of work to be done uh, in this uh, domain. Yeah, the uh, the holy grail of uh, the general purpose image generation system. Uh, it's definitely something that's, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Might be very interesting. How do you actually uh, about the future of the space? What do you think the the next big innovation would be? Yeah, so the future of image generation. Uh, moving forward, I would say so far with uh, GANs, we focus on images, uh, editing images and things like that. I think I hopefully in the next year or two, we'll see more of moving into the uh, domain of videos, uh, you know, encoding videos, editing videos, things like that. I think we're starting to see uh, GANs being used, for example, in the film industry, in VFX, CGI, things like that. It's still a very, very long way into, for, in my opinion, for being something very practical and useful in the day to day. But I think we're starting to move in that direction. So I think we'll see, hopefully, we'll see guns being used more in the film industry, for example, augmented reality um, and things like that. But as you said, you know, style GAN that is, that is able to work, or GANs in general, they're able to work on a lot of domains, on all natural images, for example, full body generation. 
that's something that would be very, very exciting uh, to see. For example, full body generation, let's say in, in the uh, video game industry and things like that. I, I have one question about uh, the the speed at which this algorithm works. Is it, how fast is it? Is it real time? Could it be used in real time applications? Well, it's near real time. I say each image uh, is less than half a second. So it's not quite uh, real time, but there has been, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, it would take you uh, several minutes uh, to take the image and find its latent representation. So I think we've come a long way, but I think there's uh, still a lot of work to be done.